Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and in the studio today I have lead engine programmer Michael Nolan. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Nolan. I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, what are game jams, why are they interesting, why would, might you want to participate in one, and then also uh, go over some tips and tricks and how I work with uh, UE4 uh, to make games. So, And you've done how many game jams? Um, probably close to 20 at this point. Okay, I, so. think, I think I'm around the same, somewhere around there. Yep. Yeah. So like my first jam was uh, the second Triangle Game Jam in I think 2008. Okay. And then I've done every Global Game Jam since then, been doing Train Jam for the past five years, uh, done some Ludum Dares, you know, just, you know, whenever I have time, when the Game mm -hmm. Jam happens, I try and do it, so. And it's probably one of the best things I know mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in terms of collaboration and also yep. some of the topics that we're gonna talk about today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, feel free, you got the okay. floor. Cool. So I've got a presentation here that I'm just gonna go through first and before we go into like a demo. So just gonna talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what is a game jam, who might wanna participate, why you might wanna participate, uh, how do you participate, and uh, then how do you actually make a thing, so. So a game jam is really simple. It's basically, you're gonna make a game and it's gonna be in a finite amount of time. So uh, that time is the biggest constraint, and so it's kind of a forcing function to make sure that you start and then finish in a limited amount of time. So there's lots of different kinds of game jams. Uh, because the goals are different for different jams, like some jams are, hey, we're gonna make th some VR thing, or we're gonna make you know, games using this piece of technology, or games in this art style. Uh, because of whatever those constraints are, that radically alters like the output of the jams. So um, time limit, team composition, the theme, and your motivation of like why are you actually doing the jam are uh, some of the biggest factors there. The mouse. Did we lose it? Oh, there we go. It had just uh, tabbed over. Uh, so here's a couple different examples of some games I've worked on in the past. Uh, so this was the first game jam game I did. It's like a 2D platformer where you play this little olive that uh, has to get into the martini glasses in order to <laughs> get higher jumping power. But the more you stay in the martini glass, the harder it gets. So your controls start you know, getting wobbly. Um, and so it's just uh, like a time attack. You're trying to get to the end of the goals. Uh, this is um, Hubert Safari Adventure. You basically drop anvils down on uh, these dodos and you're trying to massacre as many dodos as you can. Uh, the theme for this jam was extinction, so that's the, uh, the tie-in there. Um, this one is Unstoppable Grave Looter, where basically you're running around and you can't stop. Like, you, you are always moving forward, and so you're trying to frantically uh, gather uh, loot uh, and complete rituals before all of the zombies get you. And then this one is Katamari Soup Making. So it's basically you're rolling around trying to collect ingredients from a grocery store and then jumping into the soup pot to make soup. And so depending on what combination of ingredients you have, it'll come up with a different procedural name for your soup and score it. So why should you jam? Um, one of the biggest reasons for me personally is to have fun. Like it's enjoyable, it's, it's a diversion from what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, obviously, the big reason for most people is you're going to make a game. You're going to make something cool and exciting that you want to play or you want other people to play. Um, to level up your skills, like how do you you know, improve over time? How do you learn new technology and stuff like that? This can be a nice forcing function of I'm going to use X to do Y. So, um, And then the last bit is it kind of tied in with leveling up, like just building your shipping muscles. Uh, just like normal muscles, they get stronger with use. So. So, as I was saying, you know, it's one nice thing about a jam game versus like a lot of hobby projects is you start and then you finish it. Like it's, you, you actually cross the finish line there, even if it's a much smaller thing than you might be working on, you know, on a, a broader project. It's um, just that satisfaction of actually having completed a thing. I think is really nice. And it removes the, one of the thoughts I usually have when I work on a bigger project yeah. is that like, it doesn't need to be perfect, right? Yeah. You can take any way that works that gets you to the finish yep. line is okay. Absolutely. And that can be very freeing and open you up creatively as yep. well. Definitely. Um, you, you can explore new ideas, kind of like what he was saying. Um, it lets you meet people with similar interests. Like other people at Game Jam, obviously they're also interested in game development as well. Um, and also, like, you know, you can end up operating in a vacuum. Like if most of your friends are in the same discipline as you, 
So this is a chance to meet people who might be artists or sound designers or uh, you know uh, writers or whatever. In addition to just sort of other programmers, like that's my background, but obviously everybody's got a uh, different background. I had so. a doctor on my team once mm -hmm. that had never done games at all, <laughs> but they were able to provide a lot of expertise in terms of what we yep. were working on. That's really cool. Really cool, yeah. Yep. Um, so obviously, uh, most of the time, the the point is to make a game. That's not always true. Like you might go into a game jam with a motivation of, I want to learn this piece of technology, or I want to try making art today, or I want to. Uh, play around with this piece of hardware. Uh, so it's not always, like the end product is not always the goal. And so if you don't cross that finish line, that's okay, as long as you cross the finish line on whatever your motivation mm -hmm. was. So, um, like you were saying, you can afford to fail, because it's at worst you've wasted two or three days of your time. Well, why not take a risk? And you probably learned something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you'll create a finished product you can share. Uh, you can put it up online, like most jams will have some upload process or you can upload on itch.io or just put it up on like a zip link on a form or something. So um, another important thing, like one of the reasons why I like doing game jams, it's more chances at bat. Like every time you make something, you know, if you have a small percentage chance of, you know, finding a really cool nugget or like an exciting thing, then Try more times, and you're more likely to, you know, strike it rich, basically. Yeah. Um, so, sort of uh, leveling up, flexing your shipping muscles. Um, when you're doing a project start to finish, like there's different things you need to do when you're doing like pre-production or ideation. What you need to do to actually like implement your features, and then what do you need to do to polish, to ship, to package? And so this forces you to do all those different steps in one go. And if you're on a small team, you're not going to have like dedicated like a character modeler and a right. <laughs> so forth. So like one person will be wearing many hats and yeah. what they're creating. Um, and flexing your shipping muscles, like how, you know, can you scope down? How is your time management? Uh, balance for the gameplay, polish, like juice, like can you make it fun and exciting to play? So um, and you know, like I was saying, it gets easier with practice. The more times you do this, the better it's going to be in the end. So when you're preparing for a jam, uh, you really need to decide what your motivation is. Like, what what are you looking to get out of the jam? And that's going to influence like what you want to do, how you might form a team, uh, what prep you need to do. So like, if you are using a particular piece of software, you want to make sure it's updated, patched, all that kind of stuff. Um, packing, you're almost always going to want a computer, uh, probably a thumb or a flash drive to be able to transfer files between people. Uh, especially if you have like big installers or something like I'll talk in a minute why you shouldn't be using a thumb drive to store your project <laughs> um, a pen and a notebook or paper uh, it's great to be able to scribble down ideas uh, take notes that kind of thing um, consider bringing like some snacks and drinks if this is a physical jam that you're actually going to a location uh, not all jams are like some will be uh, like Ludum Dare is organized every quarter and it's an online jam so some places will have like physical get together sites, but for the most part, people are at their house jamming there. But then like Global Game Jam is come to this location and jam. Uh, other things that are useful to bring, like extension cord, microphone, game controller, like all these things are optional, but they can definitely be useful. So actually, this is what I take to jams. It's just a rollerboard suitcase like you take on an airplane. And so it makes it really easy to carry it around when like I'm in an unfamiliar campus or something. And so I've got in here an uh, extension cord, my laptop bag, a notebook, a couple sodas, um, a controller, a headset with like a boom mic, um, and you know, uh, like crayons and um, colored pencils as well. So if. Uh, Just in case there's no whiteboard and you want to. Yeah. Well, and also, like, I've seen games that do like hand drawn art and then they'll take pictures of it and then use that in their game or whatever, uh -huh. as you just never know yeah. what you might want to do. I usually say an extra extension cord, because you never know what if your teammates <laughs> <laughs> are going to be as prepared as you That's are. a good idea. Yeah. Yep. Um, so like I mentioned, uh, all sort of definitionally, a game jam has some kind of time constraint attached to it. In general, the constraints breed creativity. So like you have time limit, you probably have a theme. Uh, some jams will have opt-in diversifiers. Mm -hmm. So like Global Game Jam basically has an additional list, like 
make a game that uh, doesn't involve any text. Like, you know, it can be played entirely, you know, by people of any language mm -hmm. or, you know, things like that. Um, and then you also have an implicit constraint of what is your team composition? Because if you have a team with no artists, well, that means that you're going to have to kit bash art or make a game that doesn't really rely on art. If you have a team with no programmers, then, you know, probably tone down the mechanics a little bit, aim right. a little bit simpler for that. And, you know, ideally you can kind of try and balance teams out based on what your goal is. The Epic Mega Jam, uh, the last mm -hmm. Epic Mega Jam winner, they were a team of five artists. Yep. Uh, and one of them had to take the hat of, like, Blueprint, <laughs> Blueprint Engineer. Yep. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, the biggest reason why I think constraints help is it kind of helps to avoid this blank page problem or blank slate problem where, you know, if you're the wor world is your oyster, it's like, well, you could do anything. And so it's hard to decide on what you're actually going to do. Whereas if you have some themes, you have a constraint, it helps kind of, in some ways, like it's narrowing you down, but it's actually making you more free to then make other decisions because you're not stuck in analysis paralysis. It's so, a good way to look at it. Yeah. Um, and so like one tool I mentioned on the forum uh, that I use a lot is a Mad Lib generator. So basically you can just type in a bunch of words and that uh, verbs and uh, nouns, and it will generate like three word titles. So like Pixelated Martini Roller came out of that. <laughs> so Okay. Uh, do you have a link to that that we can show later? Uh, yeah, it's just fancygamenamer.com. Okay. Yep. Uh, and I've linked on the uh, forum post for this. I've got basically a bunch of resources listed there as well. So, Sweet. Yep. Uh, another thing to mention, you don't always have to make a ver video game at a game jam. So like uh, one year, uh, me and a friend decided to do a card game. And so... We actually started out making a video game Friday night, and it just wasn't coming together. And then on the way home, I stocked at Walmart and bought a bunch of crafting supplies. And then the next morning, uh, we started making a card game. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, uh, another thing you can do is you can do hybrid things. Like, because a game jam is not like a game that is necessarily going to be commercially sold or available or whatever, you can do more installation or art kinds of things. And so uh, this is uh, Peter Needs a Pint. And it's actually, uh, this is uh, for Molly Jam. And so this was sort of a stand-in Peter Molyneux with a Curiosity Cube that poured uh, beer. Or in this case, it was actually uh, soda. But <laughs> based on how well you did in the game, it would pour you more or less at the end of a match. Okay. So you can do a lot of fun, creative things. So, But the biggest thing, once you've figured out what you want to make based on the theme, is controlling scope. Like, the time constraint is really harsh, and you, everything will always take longer than you think it's going to. Yep. So if you come up with an idea, say you're doing a two-day game jam, come up with an idea that you think could do, be done in one day, then cut that in half. And then maybe that's on the border of achievable. Um, and don't just do it once up front. You're going to be doing this continuously. Like, you know, evaluate, like, by midday Saturday afternoon, have you actually gotten where you want to get? Mm -hmm. If not, you know, maybe it's what you're working on right now isn't important. Make sure that you're getting to try and explore that key idea. So, um, yeah. So make trade-offs. Like decide what's important in your game, what isn't. And anything that's not important, just that can come later. Like if you have time later, cool. If you have time after the jam, cool. But uh, don't, you know, do 20% of 10 different things and then never get to something that's actually playable. Yeah, I think one of the first yeah. things I try, if there's a game loop, I want that game loop. That's yeah, exactly. the first thing I go for in terms of gameplay framework. Yep. And then it's like, OK, there's a win and there's a lose condition. Cool, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, you can go from there, and you can just keep mm -hmm. making it more complicated. Um, don't let perfect get in the way of good enough. Like, one of the other things I'm going to talk a little bit about is polish your juice. And that can be really tempting to just go down the rabbit hole and do nothing but that. but. Get it to where it's good enough, it feels decent, and then you can always come back on it later. But like, you know, do a little bit on your key pieces. Like, you know, if you're making a shooting game, make the shooting feel good, make the mm -hmm. jumping feel good. If you're making a platforming game, you know, make the camera feel good and then the, you know, controls and stuff like that. Um, always be shipping. So what this means is try and package your game early on. Try, you know, make sure that you don't ever sort of leave it in a completely broken state. Like if you're starting to refactor, Try and do it in a way that, um, like, you do you copied the blueprint or something. You don't don't like get to a point where the game is just completely broken on on the floor. So, and then the last thing is because it's a game jam, uh, because this is like make one to throw one away. 
it's okay to do things that you wouldn't normally do. Like, um, make everything public. Have, have things cast to each other instead of using interfaces, stuff like that. Like, I'm not saying you should always do these, but you don't have to feel bad about doing them if you just need to get it done. Like, if it's the first time this thing needs to talk to that, and it would take a while to route the data around, sometimes it's easier to just say, you know, get player controller zero and cast to it. Please don't ever use get player controller zero in a shipping <laughs> game. <laughs> um, but in a game jam, it's cool. So. Um, another really important thing, like especially uh, I see a lot of first time jammers who just are like, I'm going to work through the night and it doesn't make sense. Like you're, you need rest, your brain works better when you're well rested. Mm -hmm. um, so get your normal amount of sleep, you know, take breaks throughout the jam, like, you know, get up, walk around, don't just sit there for 12 hours. Always play a game. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, get proper meals, like, treat it like a normal weekend that you happen to be making a game in, not, you know, i am got to do all this in one go. And they'll prepare you a little bit more for a normal, if, say, if you were working five days a week yep. at, a, at a studio, that's more what it's like. Yep. And, uh, you know, it seems paradoxical, but you will get more done if you work less because your brain is well rested and when you're not working your brain is actually still churning on those problems mm -hmm. in the back of your mind whether or not you know it and you'll come back and you know if you got frustrated with something one of the best ways to solve it is often to just take a step back either go switch to work on something else or do you know don't even work on the game jam at all and then when you come back you may have subconsciously figured out what the problem was i think a lot of engineers and or scripters and everyone who's sort of making yeah. have Either right before they go to bed or mm -hmm. as soon as they wake up in the morning, it's like, oh. Yeah, or like in the shower before you're heading in in the yep. morning, it's like, it clicks. It's just from nowhere, right? Yep. Exactly. Um, revision control is also a form of self-care. Like, one of the most frustrating things I've ever seen is when, like, a team of jammers, uh, you know, they've all been working on their own copies of the project and they're trying to merge their work together, like, you know, Saturday late at night or whatever. They're going to make mistakes, like somebody's work is going to get lost, yeah. or it's just going to take a lot of time to put it together. And you can avoid all of that by using revision control. It also makes things like what I was talking about, where if you're refactoring or trying to make a big change and you break something, well, worst case scenario, you can always just throw away like the refactoring you were doing, and you'll get back to a point where you know it was good. It removes that step of having to manually, like you said, copy a blueprint yeah. and, and then manage them and name them properly and remember. Yeah. and. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if you're curious about how to set up uh, version control, we did do a live stream just a couple uh, mm -hmm. of a couple of weeks ago on, on version control, and we did SVN there, which is a good solution depending because you might not know what the internet's like at yep. the jam site. And SVN, you can just bring a router and another PC just run it or a NAS. One of the people's laptops or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just set it up, and it, it's pretty straightforward and free. Yep, absolutely. Um, if you don't use like proper revision control, then you can always use like a cloud provider, so like uh, Dropbox or Google Drive or something like that. Um, even with those, you probably still want to like, you know, make copy two, copy three, and copy four mm -hmm. kinds of things, because they don't, you know, like, they're not really designed for revision control and syncing back to individual checkpoints. They, they have some functionality there, but that's not their primary. And I'd uh, recommend to not do the auto sync, because yeah. you will get clobbered files, and when you try to package, yeah. it will complain about those. Yeah, it, this would be more like a backup solution where you mm -hmm. copy your project into it on a regular basis. But again, best to just set up actual source control. So, um, and then please don't do this to yourself. Like having only the only copy of your game being on your laptop, like something will go wrong. Or you know, if you're working with several people and one person you know has to leave because family matters or whatever, you don't want like now the project's not available. Mm -hmm. Or passing around a thumb drive, people will copy the wrong version. It, things just go wrong. So. Uh, another thing about jams, the vast majority of jams are cooperative. Like, they're not for prizes, they're not for, like, you know, what is a winner. And even for the ones that are, usually it's still, like, there's a lot of camaraderie or, like, you know, we're, we're all wanting to make cool things. So it's not like a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, try and help out. Uh, if other people have questions or you can help, then that's great because the, the flip side can be true, too. Like, yeah. um, I've learned a lot from other people at game jams. Just watching other people work yeah. um, can be a big lesson. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, be respectful of other people's time, personal space, et cetera. You know, just be a good human being, so. <laughs> <laughs> They're good rules in general. Yeah. Or. 
Um, so you're working on your game. You've got to that first playable fairly quickly, like we were saying. Um, ask if other people have a few minutes to give it a go. Like, see how they play it. It's really tempting to like try and explain, oh, you need to do this, or this is how it's supposed to be played. But if you can, just sort of take that step back and just let them fumble at it, because you're going to get so much valuable feedback mm -hmm. there. Like, you're going to see, oh, this thing I thought was obvious in my head, they don't get it all. Like, that's not on them. That's on you to present it better. Mm -hmm. um, and then tweak it, and then ask again, or ask a different person. And just have that tight iterative loop where you're constantly trying your game, playing your game yourself, playing your game with other people. And that, that's how it's going to get better. Like, the more iterations you get, the more likely you are to arrive at something that's fun. So. I had a friend always say that he would, if he didn't have like the main game mechanic in an hour, mm -hmm. like he was doing wrong, and he would yeah. he would scrap that and do something else, mm -hmm. um, just so that he could have people just immediately come and play and give him feedback yeah. to sort of get that, so that he had time for the juice to yeah. sort of make that one mechanic. Yeah, the juice, the polish, like making it meaty and yeah. interesting. Yeah, because you can make one jump, right, or like yeah. a one button game that only have one ability. You can make that game feel really good if you have the time to spend on that kind of polish. Yep, absolutely. Um, so like I was saying before, you know, try to package early, try to package often. Um, when you're getting towards the end of the jam, you probably have some other things you'll need to prepare. So depending on where you're submitting it, it's, you know, you might fill out a description on a website or you put it in a README. Just some information about like, hey, you know, what was your pitch for the game? How, maybe talk about how it ties into the theme. Um, what are the controls or instructions? Like if there's special install instructions or you need a, a piece of hardware or something, you know, talk about that. Um, and don't forget the credits. Like mention who you are, who, what, who your team was, um, probably what game jam or game jam site mm -hmm. you were working on. And then if you use any um, third party assets, make sure that you follow their crediting or attribution guidelines. So like the Unreal Marketplace content, if you're not releasing the source assets, you can use them. If you are releasing the source assets, you can't use anything that's paid content mm -hmm. because the license doesn't allow the redistribution in that way. Um, but like the Learn tab content you can use, and uh, we also have some Marketplace content that's marked as free, so like the Infinity Blade assets, the um, Paragon assets, stuff like that. You can also use those. Although, again, check what the jam rules are, because yeah. some jams will say, hey, you've got to create all the assets during the jam, or they have to have all been made by the team that's doing the jam. But other jams are just make a cool game. Mm -hmm. So, um, But yeah, whenever you use something, you know, make sure that you're following the licenses and credits. Um, it was on Google Image Search. That's not a license. <laughs> um, it's a lot easier to keep track of this stuff as you go. So like if you download something and it's under like a CC BY license that says, you know, you must have a link to my website or a link to my Twitter account or something, write that down when you get that asset, and then that makes it a lot easier to gather all that information at the end of the jam. Because you're not kind of frantically scrambling of like, well, where, what website did that come from? So. Um, and just to uh, wrap up, like, if you remember nothing else, try and get to that first playable really fast. Like, you know, within a few hours, ideally. Uh, ruthlessly scope down, cut ideas, or punt. Don't necessarily have to say you're not going to do them. Just say you'll do them later. Um, anything that is not sort of in service of that core idea until you've gotten there. Um, use revision control, back up frequently. Uh, take breaks, get good night's sleep, and have fun. F when it gets to that, <coughs> you know, sort of you were mentioning that you have ideas that you'd like to do. Mm -hmm. Do you usually write them down? Do you do like a shared Trello board? Um, uh, so it depends on the jam. So like if it's just like two people, oftentimes it's easiest just to talk back and forth. Mm -hmm. If it's like four or five people, then I think it can get to the point where Trello or sticky notes or something like that is helpful to like list. Okay, we're gonna, you know, we think we need two levels, and so like you have a card for each level and have a card for like the shared tasks of what, you know, if we need to make props for the level or whatever. Um, that can be especially, I think it gets even more helpful the bigger the team is. Like mm -hmm. if you have several modelers and you have a bunch of different props to make, you can have a bunch of different cards and people can grab those cards and say, hey, I'm making this prop. That way you're not ending up with duplicated effort. And, and doing this sort of scrum, mm -hmm. scrum board, even having a physical scrum board, it's very real in terms of how teams work in the real world mm -hmm. uh, outside of jams. And so it can help you you know, practice yeah. for what the real world is like if you're uh, yeah. trying to get a job in the industry. I've never seen a jam use Jira, but <laughs> <laughs> Don't it wouldn't be a tor terrible fit. No, it wouldn't be terrible. I think yeah. you need a license, though. Mm -hmm. uh, a good tip that I'd suggest is hack and plan. Mm 
Okay. Uh, it's actually free. It's a mix of it's a mix of Trello and Jira. Right. Uh, just hackinplan.com. Um, it's cool. It's cool. I'll, set, I'll put a link up in the form. Yep. And then uh, Trello is also, it's basically just digital sticky notes. So you can imagine, like, you can make columns that are labeled different things and then put a sticky note in each one of the columns. So you can have stuff like, you know, need art for this, need sound for this. Um, somebody needs to implement this, this gameplay feature or whatever. And then you can just move them to, like, is it done? Is it half done but polished? Or is it not even started yet? Things like that. Um, so... Uh, next thing, I'm going to sort of jump in a little bit in, I've got a dummy project that's like not a fun game, it's not really a complicated game, and it's got no polish at all, and so we can talk a little bit about some different ways you can kind of add polish, and then also just some tips and tricks. So Cool. And so, by the way, this was actually all in Unreal, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so this is just like a silly little game where you can, you know, fire cones, and you can run around and collect gears and stand in the fire and get hurt. But, you know, obviously he's not reacting to getting in the fire. The coins don't do anything when you get them picked up. Mm. So this this might be an example of a first playable. Like, this isn't quite where i get it, because I'd want to at least have, okay, if your health reaches zero, you game over or restart. If your score hits 100, maybe, you know, you, you win screen. But once you have that core loop, that's a game. It may not be a fun game yet, but you've got the basics. So... So uh, first, I'm just going to talk about a couple of different um, things I normally do to set up a project when I'm first getting started. So you probably make a new project using a template that has controls similar to what you want. Um, but what I also do is I'll create another project that I call a content dump. And so I never add like you know starter content or um, content examples or the Infinity Blade packs directly to my target project. I'll instead add it to one of these dump projects, and then I'll migrate content across. That makes it a little bit easier to keep your, your main project clean and organized. And so one thing you'll notice here is you can see that like the title bar on this project is a different color. So there's a project setting, or sorry, an editor preference that lets you change that. So under general appearance, just down here, you have editor main child window, background override, and uh, sorry, main window and child window background override. And so you can just adjust the tense on these. And this makes it really easy if you have multiple windows open to not get confused which copy of the editor am I in. That's great. And so like we use this for different branches, uh, you know, for internal development. But even in the Game Jam project, you can make like your dump project one color, your main game, leave it the default color. Yeah. And then if you're opening up like content examples or shooter game or some other project, you can make that a third color. And then it's just really easy to tell. I love you know, that. Which it's a great tip. Yeah. Uh, another thing I'll usually do at the start of a project is go into project settings and tweak a couple things. So I'm not going to change these right now because some of them will cause like a bunch of shaders to recompile. But if you know that you're not going to do something, use something, you can make shader compilation go faster and make your final project a little bit smaller too. Mm -hmm. So just go to rendering settings. So you can adjust, um, use a static, allow static lighting, for example. If you're not using static lighting, uh, you know everything's going to be dynamic or whatever. Turning this off means you won't get like you know lighting needs to be rebuilt in the corner. It means it won't compile the shader permutations for the static lighting. Um, but obviously, sometimes you really want static lighting. If you're doing a VR game that's lit, you probably want to have as much as possible in static, yeah. or even use completely unlit stuff. Mm -hmm. so. And if that's the case, you can actually uncheck that. Yep. Oh, for that as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a couple other settings like this that adjust how many shader permutations will be generated, like supports um, stationary, skylight, and stuff like that. Um, I would probably just Google for like what these different checkboxes do if you want to play around with it. But turning them off at the start of your project will mean every time you're importing something or every time you're making a new material, it's a few fewer permutations yeah. to deal with. Um, one other setting that uh, is new in 424, and it's experimental, but, so, your mileage may vary, but it's incredibly useful. Uh, is it called? Oh, it's an editor setting, that's why I can't find it. Just a second. There we go. So it's called base classes to allow recompiling during play and editor. And so normally, when you're in Pi, uh, you know, your game is actually running, 
uh, all the blueprint editors gray out, like you can't interact with them. So this will actually let you say, no, I, I know that it's okay for these things to get uh, recreated during Pi. And so you can turn that on and then you can actually tweak these blueprints while you're playing. And so like you can be running around, that doesn't feel right, let me change the blueprint. Now it feels right. Um, and so this won't work for every class. Like, and some classes will have like life cycle problems where when it gets recreated, like references to it won't be correctly updated and stuff. Mm -hmm. But for anything that's like a statically placed object in the scene or like a transient thing, like you know, the, the part of the projectile when you fire it or the sound that plays or whatever, um, those all should work fine. So <clears throat> I, I know it's new, uh, but yeah. well, what's generally your workflow when you're doing with this? Will you add them sort of right before you're iterating on them? Uh, it's usually I'll just set it up like when I make something. So for example, like anything that's based off camera shake, I want to be able to adjust the, the settings on that. Okay. Um, I'll create like a base class for effects, like something that plays a sound and a camera shake and a vibration and everything else all together. Like, you know, um, I'll add that to the list. I might add like the base class for like my world props, um, those kinds of things. I mean, you can go the nuclear option and just add actor and then be really careful not to uh, recompile like probably the player controller and the pawn are the two mm -hmm. that may not work well. And it won't crash if you do it for the most part. It just might not, you know, you might lose input or something yeah. like that. And worst case scenario, you just hit stop pi and then start pi again. So, um, so I'll show off like what that lets us do in a little bit. Um, what else for project settings? I think those are the, the main things right now. Uh, you can also go like check out the packaging settings and turn on or off like whether or not you want to compress your pack files and stuff like that. Engine but content is yeah. usually something, engine especially content, if you're yeah. trying to have a small uh, yeah. package game, turning off engine content. What I usually do is I have a folder that I call engine content copy. Yeah. So anything that I actually want to have in the final package game, mm -hmm. you when can I grab it, there. I copy it from engine content and move it back over to my folder, and then I know that like it will be packaged. Yep. Saves okay. you about 300 megs, I think. Okay. So. So in this game, we can see that like you know you can run around, you can fire cones, and you can get damaged, and you can collect coins. So there's not a lot of oomph right now. Like everything just feels kind of flat. Like you stand in the fire, you can't even tell that anything's really happening other than it's you know debug printing in the corner. So let's change that so that like the mannequin actually does something as a result of that. So over here. So in my dump project, I added the uh, animations, uh, the animation starter pack. And so this has a couple of hit reacts in here. So you can see what these look like. So you know, you'll kind of see, you know, he's he's taking damage. So we'll go ahead and grab these. And so in asset actions, there is a tool called migrate. And so that this is how you move content between different open mm -hmm. UE4 projects. And so you can see it's selected a bunch of different stuff. I happen to know that I'm not going to need all of this. And so I'm going to uncheck like the mesh and the textures. Actually, not all the mesh. But like the fact that the textures are going to import wrong is OK, because I'm going to move this over to the mannequin that's already in the other project. So we can just turn off like materials. Are those checkboxes new? Uh, I think they're new in like 423 or 424. Yeah, yeah, they're they fairly are. new. It used to just be. We're All or nothing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and so, like, these are the four that we actually care about. And then you also need the skeleton. And when in doubt, you don't have to uncheck this. You can just let it do everything. You're just going to end up with a few extra assets you'll have to go back and delete later. So you hit OK. And it's going to ask you, where do you want to go? And so you want to select the content folder of the target project. So I've got jam presentation and then content. And then you don't go any deeper than this. You always just go to the content folder. And then it'll create the hierarchy that matches where it came from. So it's telling me it, some of this stuff already exists because I'd already copied a previous asset. And so I'm just going to say no to all. I don't, I don't need it to overwrite them. So now we can switch back to the Jam project. And it's created these assets over here. But it's all those assets are pointing to this uh, uh, the skeleton that came along with it in the skeletal mesh. So that's not actually what we want. So we're going to go ahead and consolidate this. So consolidate is like I've got two assets that I basically want to replace the references from one to the other. So 
so you can see I've got these different skeletons. And so we want to combine the mannequin skeletons. So it's actually called replace references now instead of consolidate. And so this is just asking me which one is the one that I want to keep. And then all the ones that I don't select will go into that one. Okay. And so we can see game mannequin is the one that you know the sample started with. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one I want to keep. And then this other one, I'm going to replace the references from the one I migrated over to point to that one. And there it says consolidate. Yeah. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that was just asking me, do I want to delete the, the one that was going away? So now that's done. You can see it, it left a redirector because I have show redirectors on. You don't have to worry about that for the most part. Do you want to show them how you can actually turn that filter on? Because it's a little hidden. Yeah, sure. Um, well, actually, in general, f uh, filters is one of the things that I think a lot of people sleep on. This can be really useful for finding different assets in mm -hmm. your project. So usually I'll turn on like blueprint classes, uh, material, you know, particle system, static mesh. Then I also turn on uh, material instance. But then there's a lot of other interesting filters in like miscellaneous and other filters. And so in other filters, there's this thing called showed redirectors. Yeah. And so redirectors are basically like symlinks or pointers from one file to another. So when you rename a file, when you uh, do things like consolidate, it'll drop like a pointer. So anybody who is unloaded who is pointing to that old asset will then still point to the old asset, but then that will point to the new asset. And then you can always replace them by selecting a redirector and saying fix up. And then that'll make the links go like that, and it'll resave all the things that were pointing to it. But that's usually not something you want to do in when you're working in a team, uh, unless everybody's got all their stuff checked in. Because the fixing up of references, anything that they had locally that created a new reference to the old asset isn't going to get fixed up, because you don't know about it yet. The rule so. I usually go by is don't rename anything <laughs> during the jam. Stick, stick to what you... I think renaming's fine. Just don't fix up redirectors okay. unless everybody's got all their work checked in. So that's like a cleanup thing you might do at the end of the jam mm -hmm. or like you know once a day kind of thing, if any. But it's also fine to just leave the redirectors around. Yeah. So. But by default, they're hidden. And so this, this filter lets you actually see them. Um, but each one of these things that you turn on or off is a button. And so you can like turn it on and off. So like you can just leave it at the top root of the content folder, and it's like, let me see all the particle systems in the project. Or let me see all the materials. And these work in conjunctions. So like you can go down into a deeper folder as well. Um, I was going to mention this later on, but I'll go ahead and do this right now. There's also uh, in use by level and used in any level and not used in any level, which are really useful for towards the end of the jam. If you're trying to clean up your packaged game size, you can use these to get an idea of like, well, what assets I might you know I migrated in, but I actually ended up not using. Um, and so you can use those to try and clean up. You but if you have something that isn't used, and you want to know, like, can I actually delete it? Um, it's not. You shouldn't always just like delete everything. So you can do this thing called Reference Viewer, which actually shows you, you know, what this is the asset. Things to the right of it are things that it references. So like, the static mesh or skeletal mesh, you know, references the skeleton asset and the physics asset. But things to the left are things that it you know, that reference it. And so you can see that that's actually a circular dependency. That this thing depends on each other. And you can see this redirector actually says, you know, all of these still reference that old name. And so this tool is just really useful for like project management and trying mm -hmm. to figure out why does this still exist? Or if you're trying to break a reference or, you know, trying to understand why is this getting loaded or how is this getting pulled in? Uh, this is like sort of the first tool to go to. Um, kind of related to that, there's also something called the size map, which lets you see, you know, why is something big. So, doo -doo -doo. It's a little further down in the in the main one. There it is. Yep. And so you can see this is like it. The things it references aren't very big. It itself is pretty big. So you can see it's yeah. But if we go over to like one of the maps, so. Doo -doo -doo. Where is it? And we'll just search. So there we go. And so you can see it kind of breaks up, you know, where is all this data coming from? And 
so you can see the world itself is a decent size. But then like the sky texture is 15 megs. So, you know, if you didn't need like blue clouds in your sky and you'd, you know, put like everything inside of a building, then you could go ahead and remove that from your project and mm -hmm. save a decent amount of size. So th this is the kind of thing that you don't probably don't normally do during a jam or you do during that last hour of the jam, but it's still useful to know it yeah. exists. So. Okay. So let's pop back and so what we want to do is get these hit reacts playing. Oops. So in here, you know, like we walk over, we take damage, but you know, nothing happens. So we've already got the player taking damage. So, like I said, this is jam quality code, not saying this is showing off the best way to do things. Um, but, you know, so, you know, it just s subtracts the health and sets the new current health. And so we know that something's happened, but we don't, you know, nothing's doing anything with it yet. So if we open the Anim Blueprint. What was the shortcut you used? Oh, so that's Control P, or I think it's uh, Control Alt O is the other binding, or Control. Control O is for maps, I think. Uh, it's, yeah, Control Alt O or Control P, they're the same binding. And so this is what's called the asset picker. And so basically, it's it's like a content browser that you can just immediately start mm -hmm. typing in, and you can use the keyboard. So like I can open up the Anim Blueprint, and then just hit down and hit enter, and it opens up. And so like that shortcut is you know really useful for just moving around the yeah. editor quickly instead of having to tab over to the content browser and find yep. it. Yeah. And there's also one that's Control Tab, which lets you switch between different tabs really quickly as well. So in here, um, we got those new hit reacts in. So now we can see. Actually, they're not showing up. So we may have repaired them to the wrong blueprint, or to the wrong skeleton. So this is the skeleton that it's using, UE4 mannequin skeleton. So that's what we wanted. So this one skeleton is UE4 mannequin skeleton. Hmm. So. There, it just apparently didn't refresh. So we'll just open all four of those. There we go. So now we've got these four hit reacts. Let's drag in each one. So what we can do is we can just do a random node, or blend by random. Actually, uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and skip that right now, and I'll just make it play one of the hit reacts. So we want to blend this in. So there's a couple different ways we could do this. We can make it a different state in the state machine. We can do a blend by bool. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that's actually usually the best is uh, what's called a montage. So you can create a montage that's like, I, I'm going to plug this in somewhere in the graph. And so montages can have like one track that'll be like the base layer, one track that is an additive layer, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And um, then you can trigger from gameplay saying, hey, this montage should play now. And then it'll play a separate timeline. But for the uh, jam thing, we can just play like a single effect. So we'll create a Boolean for uh, was recently damaged. Promote. So then if it's true, we'll blend this in. If it's false, we're going to use this uh, sort of the him being at that idle point. Then we'll replace that. And so this is something I did before. So like the, the default graph you get in a brand new blank project just has the state machine going over to the output pose. So I added a, what's called a layered blend by bone which allows you to do kind of like upper body, lower body stuff. And so I had imported this idle hip rifle, idle rifle hip animation earlier. And then I'm blending that in, basically starting at the spine. So anything below the spine always uses this, the mo locomotion state machine. And above the spine, it starts to use this, whatever we're doing over here. So the hit react will only affect the upper body. 
So now we can test this out um, by checking or unchecking the was recently damaged. So you can see, kind of. It's getting a little. Yep. And uh, this is actually probably best done with the state machine, because you can make the state machine automatically transition back out when it finishes playing. Because doing it by just setting the bool on its own, you're going to end up with uh, the hit react potentially starting to loop back you know, if you don't manage the time just right. So. And if it was multiplayer, yeah. there would be latency. You, you're not entirely sure, even if you set that delay to be exactly the time of the animation, mm -hmm. you're not sure that that's going that's to That's going to be, yeah. yeah. But for right now, for this jam thing, this will be fine. So now we've got this Boolean, but we need to get it from somewhere. And so what we can do is this already gets the pawn owner and grabs some stuff off of it. So in the player pawn, what we're not doing right now is we're not returning, you know, we're not thinking about when were we damaged, just that we took damaged. So let's go ahead and create a new variable that's like the last time we were damaged. So we'll change that to be a float. So now, every time we get damaged, we're going to remember when were we damaged. And then in the animation blueprint, we can pull that. So what I did there is I double clicked on the wire, and that creates a reroute node, which helps you organize your blueprints. So I'm casting it to the player pawn that we actually have so that we can actually get properties off of it. So now we can actually grab the uh, last time that it was damaged. And we can compare that to what is the current time. There are a lot of time-related functions in, yeah, the, there in the library. Just make sure. Yep, this is what we want. So we want to know the time since. So then we can just uh, compare that to some threshold. That's a. So say we've you know, recently damaged, and then we can save that off. Now, this is actually going to be you know, the last time damage will start out at 0. And so you know, this would actually show up if you're you know, for those first 0.2 seconds. Mm -hmm. And so what you probably also want to do is say, also, this needs to be greater than 0, like it was set at some point. And if both of those are true, then we were recently damaged. And there's other ways to do this, but this is just you know one quick way we can hook this up. So now let's try it out. Uh, and it doesn't work. So it? let's figure out why it doesn't work. I thought I saw it. Oh. Yeah. Oh, there it's working. See? Yeah. I must just not have been standing right in the fire. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and it's mandatory to do on a payo during the game jam of ah. Uh, eh. Yeah. Ooh. Although, actually, that's another thing that could be a lot of fun, is you can actually use a microphone to record your voice yep. and use that as sound effects, as placeholders or whatever. Um, the, I did a, like a, a little like, shoot 'em up where you're flying around on the back of a snake, and uh, all the sound effects were just like pew, 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 and stuff like that. Yeah. So. One of the best Flash games I ever <laughs> played was completely on a payout, and it just made me laugh yep. every time. Every action made me laugh. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's happening, but this still doesn't feel juicy. Like, you know, it's. He's taking some damage, but it doesn't feel great. Um, and also, like, he's actually gone all the way down to zero health, and nothing's really changed. There's not a sense of urgency that I really need to get out of this mm -hmm. fire. So let's try and make that a little bit meatier still. So back in the player pond, when we take the damage, you know, all we're doing right now is just subtracting this value, and then the animation blueprint is listening, and it knows that it needs to do something. But we could also do something here. So like we could play a sound, we can play a camera shake, so on and so forth. So let's actually hook up playing a sound. Oh. 
So we're going to play a sound centered on the actor, and it's just going to be, oh, well, we have no sounds. So now we can go over and grab some from that dump project. Or we could import them. Uh, there's a cool tool called BFXR. Let me just grab that real quick and show that off. This is great for uh, placeholder sound effects. So. Oops. Uh, do you see where it went? Uh, no. See if you oh, click it, it on the. Yeah, that's it. We're just on the second monitor. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> We're still up. <laughs> we have a black background. And so this is uh, basically like a little modular synthesis program, basically. Okay. But it's got a bunch of presets for sort of 8-bit gamey sounds. So I don't know if we can get the audio um, from the... We data. might be able to. One second. OK. OK, we should have audio now. Not hearing it. We're not able to. Oh, okay, the TV gotcha. is muted. Okay. Well, then I, I'll have a hard time figuring out exactly which is the right one. But say you know that we might be able to change it uh, when the settings. Oh, okay. We can uh, get the sound here. Oh, uh, you know what? If we do that, they won't be able to hear it. Ah, okay. <laughs> so won't worry about it. Won't go into too much depth on audio. But like this could be really useful for like let me get some quick placeholder. Uh, sounds in, like even if you're working with somebody who's going to do sound for you, this can let you prototype and then you can always replace them later or you can just end up shipping with them. Okay. And so you can basically save, like after you've adjusted the parameters or whatever and got something you like, uh, you can save it um, and that'll save like basically just a little text file that is all the settings and so somebody else could load that up. That's like the source art. Okay. And then you can also uh, export wave, and so that's what you're actually going to import into Unreal. And so uh, another thing I usually do in my projects is I set up what I call a source art directory. So, you know, in our Jam presentation project, we've got a source art folder. And so we can do like, um, so now we can just save this as jump. Then back in the Jam presentation project, we can go ahead and import that. So, and another nice thing about this, once you've done this once, it'll remember that folder hierarchy. So it'll keep asking, you want to import something from source art mm -hmm. time and time again. And because it's under the project, if you're using source control, this would get checked in along with the rest of the project. Um, on much bigger projects than a game jam, uh, usually we still have a source art folder, but it'll be in a separate directory because not everybody wants to sync all of yeah. the assets when you're syncing like a game that's 100 gigabytes or whatever. Um, but for a game jam game, putting it right inside the project is a nice time saver because you're not going to have a ton of stuff in here anyway because you can't make a ton of stuff in a game jam. And it's easy if you're working so. with someone who's not used to uh, using source control. Yeah. Uh, and then you can just tell them, hey, just always get latest. Yep. Of exactly. The, of the one folder. So now we've got our audio. It's playing now. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> we have to turn it up on the <laughs> yep. on the TV. Okay. So now uh, we can go over to Player Pond and just go ahead and play that. So now, uh, obviously, jump is not really a pain sound, but it'll it'll get the job done. So now that definitely starts to ground the animation, so you can kind of you see something's actually happening. Mm -hmm. But it's also really repetitive, and so like one thing you can do when you play a sound is you can click on this uh, more properties drop down, and so now you can see volume multiplier, pitch multiplier, start time. So you can do things like you know randomize this a little bit. That's one way to do it, but this is very hard coded. Yeah. And so a much better way to do it is to use what's called a gameplay queue, or a sound queue, rather. And so we'll go back over to the sound asset that we made. So we imported this as just a wave, and so there's not really much you can do to edit it. What we can do is we can do create queue. And so now we've got a jump sound queue. So back in the player blueprint, we'll change it to use jump queue instead of jump. And right now it'll sound exactly the same. There's no difference. but this is another graph we can go in and edit. And so you know, you could actually import like three or four different jump sounds, then pick a random node and pick between the different ones. Mm -hmm. You can also do like randomization of the modulation and stuff like that. So if we do like modulate, 
then this basically every time it's just going to pick a number between these two values for the pitch and the volume. And so you can say, like, you know, let's actually shift it between 0.8 and 1.2, 0 0.9, and 1.1, let's say. So my default values as well. Yep. And so now you can try this out. It sounds pretty similar. I mean, this is a very one note sound. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a lot of other stuff. If you use other samples, it's going to be a little bit more obvious. But we can, like, kind of shift this down so to make it more exaggerated. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yep. So that's one way to get a lot more bang for your buck out of these assets is like basically with randomization, with modules, uh, with uh, modulation and stuff like that, you mm -hmm. can adjust, get something slightly different every time. Um, one thing that we've done so far is we're doing all of this directly in the player pawn blueprint. This is going to be probably the highest contention file in your Game Jam project is this, maybe your player controller, maybe your game state or game mode. And so it can be really useful to try and split these up um, in sort of a couple different ways. So one thing I'll normally do for a Game Jam is I'll create like a base class for the player pawn that has like what is the really core gameplay mechanics and then separate out all the juice so that that's actually a child blueprint of it. And it, basically, the parent blueprint will fire events, and the child blueprint will respond to those events. And that allows two people to be in there at once. Like, one person can be working on the gameplay, mm -hmm. another can, person can be working on the polish at the same time, and they're not conflicting with each other. Although, obviously, if you need to go back in and add another event, you know, you, you can still have to, like, reach over and poke somebody and ask. Yeah. But uh, that kind of thing helps a lot. Another thing you can do is, like, split it out entirely. So, the ability system... Uh, which I don't recommend using for like a small game jam, but is great for big projects, mm -hmm. has something called a uh, gameplay queue. So kind of in the same way we talked about the sound queue, it's I want to raise, then event happened, and then I want to respond to that event. And it lets you basically decouple them entirely. They're only bound by a, a gameplay tag. And so we can do sort of a poor man's gameplay queue by just spawning an actor whenever one of these things happens. And then all the details of what happens can be over in this other actor blueprint. And so, like, that other actor can play the sound, play a camera shake, play, uh -huh. you know, a screen shake, play controller vibration. And then now I never have to touch the pawn to tweak what a given thing does. And you can use child blueprints to kind of organize that your stuff. So you can have, like, you know, light hit, medium hit, and heavy hit, mm -hmm. which, you know, medium and heavy are just parented off light, and all they do is change sort of the strength of the effects. Um, so let's go ahead and demonstrate that. So we can just make a new blueprint here. We're just going to base it off uh, actor right now, and we'll call it B base uh, gameplay queue. And so this doesn't do anything; it doesn't have anything. So uh, this is just going to be so that we can keep pointers to this. Mm -hmm. And now we'll create a couple different children. So like this one is B took damage. Let's also create one that's like B fired weapon. And actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create one more in here. Actually, I'll create one more and then repair it. So, the uh, standard. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make a sort of standard one that knows how to play a sound, plays a camera shake, and stuff like that. So then all you have to do is fill out properties on the other ones. So in this one, this is where we'll actually put the meat. So. Let's go just go and create a couple of variables. I did not know about that button. Which one? I did not know you could click the actual. Oh, um, the the little pill. Yeah. Uh huh. I always yeah. go to the details window. Yeah, and so uh, you can also right click on something to turn it into an array oh, as well. That's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, the, the left click on this lid on the type icon, it will actually change what the type. Lets you pick what the type is. Mm -hmm. Right click changes like is it an array or whatever, and then you know it's basically the same thing you get over here where you know you can pick what is the type, and what is, or what is the kind of type, and what is the type. 
That makes perfect sense because the buttons are exactly the same. Yep. It's in different locations. So, case. So, one minor gotcha here is camera shakes are always like classes. And so, like, instead of picking an object reference, you'll pick a class reference. Mm -hmm. And you'll create a blueprint based on that in order to define what a camera shake is. And I'll go over that in a minute. Um, and then the particle system. What is it? I always forget what these are called. It is particle system. There we go. So now we've got sort of like you know these three different default things that it could do. And so we'll see if we got one of these. So what I did here is there's a lot of shortcuts in the Blueprint Editor. So I held down the S key, and then I did a single click. And there's other ones like B key and single click to make a branch, and so on and so forth, that are really useful um, time-saving shortcuts. Um, so Sequence Node is going to basically run things in series. And so like I'm going to do a bunch of these is valids. And so instead of chaining the is not valid back you know, to keep the flow in one go, I can do basically one line for each logical thing. So basically, if we have a sound to play, then we're going to play that sound. Do you want to show what you can do with the, um, the sound to play reference there instead of the is valid node? Oh, yeah. I mean, you can also uh, com uh, convert it. So you can convert to a valid That's to get. That's my favorite. Yep. I'm old school. I, <laughs> <laughs> I wish we had it for the, the bool. Mm -hmm. So you can right-click the bool and just make it a branch. Yeah. That's actually not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and grab the effect to play and the camera shake to play as well. So camera shake, uh, because it's a class, you, instead of is valid, you do is valid class, which only comes in the, the Boolean form. So then you have to use a branch. We'll go ahead and do one of each. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And there's no right or wrong way yep. in terms of this. It's just whichever workflow you prefer. Mm -hmm. We don't need to adjust anything else right now on that. So we're going to play a sound on ourselves. We're going to play an emitter on ourselves. Then we're also going to play a camera shake. And so what you can do, this is a little bit uh, like you actually play this on something. So what we'll do for, again, game jam, we're just going to get the pawn for the player. Then we're going to get the camera manager, or get player controller. Actually, we'll just go straight to player controller. They were wondering earlier, why shouldn't you get player controller zero? Oh, um, because if you're making a single player game, single screen game, not networked, it's totally fine. There's, mm -hmm. there's nothing bad about it. But it's a really ha bad habit to get into once you start getting into a multiplayer game. Because on each client, you know, you've got your local player controller. Mm -hmm. But on the server, all of those player controllers exist. And the numbering is not going to be deterministic or useful in any particular way. So whenever you want to do something on a player controller, especially on the server, you want to route it to, you know, you, you want to have a route from whatever's happening to the player that it's happening to. And so instead of calling a player controller by index and having to figure out an index, you know, you can just, like, if you've got a pawn, you can get the controller who's controlling that pawn, you know, because the pawn stepped into a thing, so you know who the instigator is. Mm -hmm. um, it's also bad for split screen games. Because, yep. like, if you're in a split screen game, you actually have two player controllers on that local player. And um, that's what the index is for. But in general, you know, if you're doing stuff the right way for like a split screen game, you won't need to try and figure out the index because you always have a route from it. So, for example, you add your HUD to you know each of the player's viewports. Mm -hmm. When you add it, um, every widget knows a route to a player controller, and so now you you know what player controller your HUD's for. So your HUD doesn't have to call get player controller zero. It can just say get my player controller, then get my controlled pawn instead of getting player pawn or get player controller. And the same thing's true for like most stuff in the world as well. Mm -hmm. But for Game Jam, it, it, it's really easy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then the, the, the controller has a reference to what's called the camera manager. 
And then this is the thing that you can like add things like uh, screen shakes to. Oops, I'm gonna shake. And so this thing takes a uh, camera shake to play. And so you can sort of scale it. And so like we could give it a strength for like, you know, is it a light shake or a heavy shake? Or you can do that in the asset. So now we've got this set up. We've got kind of uh, a base thing. So I created these out of order. So like you can see, this is based off of actor. But I actually want it to be based off of that parent class I made. So I can say reparent blueprint and then change it. So now this is based off the base gameplay queue, but then the other two I created, like the, the concrete versions, aren't yet. So go back to those. So like B took damage and B fired weapon. So you see it defaulted these to the date only blueprints because I hadn't put any code in them yet. So I can switch it over. Now reparent. Okay, so now that's done, I'm just going to close these and reopen them so that I get back to that date-only blueprint to show you what that looks like. Oops. No, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I think there's a way to switch here, but I don't remember how. Yeah, I think there is. But what we can do is we can just set these properties. So like we created uh, effect to play. So when we fire our weapon, you know, don't have anything that's really perfect here. We'll use the bomb for now, but that's probably not what we want to use in the end. Then let's go over here. Let's get a shoot. That sounds good. So we're going to export that. And you can also hit a mutate, which will like basically stay kind of roughly where it was and then tweak it a little bit. And okay. So you can get uh, variations that way as well. So we're just going to grab two of those. Then back over here in our audio folder, we can import them. Then we can create a queue. Oops. You want to wait player? I'll just copy this one. So now we've got our eight and our nine, and then we can do. So got some variation. Then we'll do a modulate. So now it's going to pick randomly between one of these two, it's, and it's going to further shift it a little bit more, just so your shooting sound doesn't sound super repetitive. Mm -hmm. We got all that. Now we can plug that into here. Okay, so we've got these two. Then this third thing, I'm going to go ahead and, this is something I made earlier and I'll explain how to make that in just a minute, but go ahead and hook it up for the demonstration. So now our fired weapon blueprint is going to play a sound, play an effect, and do a camera shake once it spawns. So we will go back to the player pawn. So down here is input action fire. So whenever you fire, right now it's spawning a projectile. We could actually put this in a projectile so the projectile owns, like, what does it feel like to spawn? But for right now, we'll go ahead and spawn it here. So we're gonna pick fire. And... Two, two, two. And so what we probably want to do is we probably want to pass in the instigator or make an expose on spawn parameter of who caused this queue to happen. So like, you know, this pawn or whatever. Right now we're not actually using that. We're just using the location. But, but if you make a more complicated queue that's like, okay, now you're on fire for five seconds, or you make a queue that's like you have a glowing halo or something, you, you need to know who you're going to attach it to, basically. And so you can pass that in as part of this. Okay. So now we've got this hooked up. So when we run, 
<laughs> that's a little overkill. <laughs> but you can see that firing is definitely a lot more interesting than it was before. Yes. Yeah. So we can tone that down. Uh, but for right now, let's just go ahead and pull the particle system off so that we can show off something different. So I'm just going to get rid of that and play. And so you see I had to stop and do that. Let's go ahead and change it back while we're playing. So remember that setting I talked yeah. about? So now that we've made this new base blueprint class, we can opt that in, so now we can edit those blueprints while we're playing. So we can go back to Editor Preferences. And in this case, you know that this actor will never exist in the world. Yeah, they're always transient. To. But even if they exist in the world, it does actually handle that. It'll replace all the references. Okay. It's that if you have certain life cycles that are not in something that the replace references archiver can get to, um, it, so hard to explain exactly what those circumstances are, mm -hmm. and that's why it's still experimental. Yeah. Once we can make it, you know, a little more sort of you know foolproof to use, we'll probably turn it on by default. Cool. So. But now we can pick base gameplay queue. So now we'll be able to edit this actually while we're in Pi. So let me go ahead and make this play in a new new window. So uh, Windows supports uh, snapping windows, so I can snap this to the left and then snap the editor to the right. And so now I can you know, see in here. And you can hit Shift F1 to get your mouse cursor back, which is a little bit easier than if you had to do the, the tilde stuff before. But Shift F1 sort of lets you get it out and then you can click right back in to get there. So you see we're firing, no, no effect. But now I can actually be tweaking this stuff while I'm playing. So just close some of these. So now you can see it's actually not grayed out anymore. So I can actually adjust stuff while we're here. So I can just you know switch this over to here. Oh, you didn't and even have to compile there. Yep. But for just setting properties, it'll actually propagate. OK. Yep. But this can make uh, that iteration time a lot faster. So in this simple game, you know, there's not a lot to run around. But you can imagine if you're making a game as a platformer, like you're halfway through the level, yeah. and you don't want to have to like run all the way back uh, from the start of the level every time. So this can save you a lot of time on iterating. Another thing you'll see right now is the camera's shaking, but it's really subtle. Let's say that you know this this cone launcher is meant to be like really meaty and powerful. Mm -hmm. So let's adjust that. So I made this camera shake blueprint earlier, and we can have a look at it. And it's got the same setting where it's allowed to be modified while we're in Pi. And so all a camera shake modifier is is you just create a blueprint based off of the class camera shake. Okay. And then you're basically just using it as a data asset, like you're setting properties on it. And so, you know, it's got all this different stuff. Right now, you know, it's doing a little bit of shake in, in all the axes. And then it's doing a little bit of fob oscillation. Actually, none right now. So let's turn this up. So what this is going to do is it's going to make it, like, punch in. And so now we can see. But that on its own doesn't feel that interesting. Mm -hmm. Oops. I accidentally quit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so let's up like the roll pitch and yaw just a little bit. So like we'll just make this, let's try three on each of these and see what that looks like. That's definitely a little more impactful. Yeah. But this, like I was saying, this is the kind of thing you can spend an entire jam just, just iterating and tweaking on. So mm -hmm. usually what you want to do is you want to get to a first pass that is sort of good enough, and then you can always come back later and, and polish it. Because your opinion will also change as you play. Like, man, this is getting to me. It's too much, or it's not enough, or, or whatever. So don't spend too much time on your first pass for this kind of stuff. But our original thing where we wanted to hit React to feel better, it's still not using that. So don't forget to you know, you change that to use, fire one of these cues, just like the other one. But one thing I didn't talk about, or didn't demonstrate, is the cue that we spawned is just sitting there. It's just going to live forever. And so you'll actually probably do want to clean it up. And so, like the quick, dirty jam way, is to just make a delay and then, or set the lifetime of it, and yeah. then the asset will destroy itself. The nicer way would be to like actually query the length of the particle system, mm -hmm. the length of the uh, sound cue, and take the max of all those, and then destroy themselves when all of those are finished. I think you can assign an event dispatch. Yeah, or you can use an yeah. event. Yeah, and then you'll just sort of like vote, like when all three vote that they're done, I'm done, so therefore I can go away. Right now, we're not going to worry about the leak. And honestly, if you did this in a game jam. 
probably wouldn't notice. You'd probably find, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Depends how long. How long and how much. Like, if you have a bunch of different things off in the world that are, like, spawning something every couple seconds, it can add up. Like a Gatling gun or something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another thing to watch out for with these cues is if you do do that thing where you, like, measure how long does it take to finish, if it's a looping particle system or if it's a looping sound cue, it's never going to finish. And so then you have to be careful okay. where, okay, if you spawn one of those, you need to make sure that you then go and clean it up. And we've actually added uh, safeguards in the engine when you're using the gameplay cue system I mentioned, where a gameplay cue that wants to play a looping sound that's set as a burst will be like, no, this is an error. I'm never going to clean myself up. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, just a second here. Uh, one other thing that we can do, like, you know, when you step into this fire is right now, you know, we got the player taking a hit react, but maybe we actually want to do something where, you know, it, it's visible on him too. So we can grab the blueprint. So uh, just one other key shortcut I did there is when you select something in the editor, you can hit control E to just immediately go to whatever the, the authoritative asset for that is. So for a blueprint, it'll open the blueprint editor. If it were a static mesh, it'll open static mesh editor, so on and so forth. And you can also hit control B, which will find it, which basically just puts it in the browser. So those are really useful for like figuring out like what is this thing in the world, where does it go if you don't have the details panel open. So in here, you know, back over here where we're, you know, we're playing the sound effect, we can do uh, something else like you know, set a material parameter on the, the player. So we can see what the player's material is right now. Do, do, do. It's just this MI character, which you know is just overriding the body color. Then the master material is here. And so, uh, okay. So let's just add like a, a pulse to this. So the one of the easiest ways to do like a pulsating, like you know, oscillating kind of things is a, a sine wave. So we can just drop down a sine node, wire in time, so that'll make it you know go up and down based on the time, and then we need to do something with it. So we've got body color. Let's create another color. That's let's call it um, hit color. So now the player is going to flash this color when they get hit. Is is our goal? Okay. So just make that. I've actually kind of painted myself in a corner because I made the, the pawn red already, but <laughs> maybe we'll make him actually flash green because he doesn't like green. So now what we can do is we can interpolate between these colors. Based on the sign. Now, by default, a sign is going to go from minus 1 to 1, which is not what we want here, like because we want a 0 to 1 value uh, for the LERP. So we can do a scale bias. And the default settings for this node actually do exactly what we want. We don't have to adjust it. But if you weren't sure what they do, one thing that's really cool is the uh, debug node. So you can pick uh, debug float 2, 3, 4, or just like debug scalar. And so what this will do is it'll let you wire a number into it. And then usually you want to map that to a color. So in this case, let's just break this other link. So we're always going to get this input color. So once it finishes compiling shaders, we're actually going to see it'll print a number directly in the material. So this is great for trying to figure out, you know, what is the range of this? Do I have the math right? Does this, is this doing what I expect? And you can see now that's going between 0 and 1, which is what we want. But we actually probably don't want it to go quite that, you know, quite that much. We don't want to go all the way to the other color. Mm -hmm. But for now, you know, you can always like add a multiplier or add a, a remap or whatever. So let's go ahead and hook this back up. So oops. and so now what this is going to do is it's just going to constantly ping pong and forth back and between these colors. But we only want to do that when we're actually hit. And so what we can do is add another multiply, which is going to multiply by, you know, basically what are we wiring into here. So a lerp is just going from A to B when alpha goes from 0 to 1. 
And so what we're going to do is we're just going to make alpha always read 0 when we're not hit. And then I'm going to right click on this and convert to parameter. And this will let us set it from code. So we can call this um, hit effect. And so right now it's 0, so we don't see anything happening. So I'm going to go ahead and hit apply, save this material, and then I'll go back over to the blueprint and actually use it. So, so in the construction script, uh, what we can go ahead and do is we grab the mesh, then we can create a material instance. And then we'll go ahead and save that off. So what we can do is now we, we can grab this and set properties on it later on. So back over here, you know, when we're getting hit, we can grab that variable we just added, and then do. And now we pick that same property name that we just added over here. So we see what we called it. We called it hit effect active. Set the one. So right now what's going to happen is I'm going to get into the fire, and then he'll just change to be playing this forever. We're not setting it back, but just to show what it looks like. Nice. Yep. It's very clear something's <laughs> happening there. Yes. Although you also see that he lost his default color, probably because I maybe didn't wire in the default color. Are we using the instance or the master mat? We should be using the instance. Let's just double check here. Mesh. Yeah, we're using the instance. Mm -hmm. So oh, we'll worry about that later. Because we're running a little short on time right now. So you can see, OK, he took damage. Because he's now not red, we can actually make that damage red. So we'll go back to the material. There we go. But we want to turn it back when we're done. So what we can do is, there's a couple different ways to do this. I would probably actually drive it with a timeline. But uh, one real quick thing you can do is you can just throw in a delay. So we want it to happen for 0.2 seconds, and then we want to set it back. So like I was saying, this is not always the cleanest way to do these kinds of things, but for a game jam, you do whatever works, and then you move on to the next thing. So, Ship it. Yep. Um, one great technique for driving this kind of stuff is you can use timelines or you can use curve assets, and then that lets you just click on points and then shape it to do exactly what you want it to do. And so now we can see that I run through, take some damage, and you know, sort of it's like, you know, it's just really clear that he's taking damage, but it's not staying stuck on him forever. So that's definitely feeling a lot better. These coins, though, they, they're still, they just disappear. So that's not very good. So one last thing we can do is let's make the coins actually like snap to you. Okay. Like, you know, it's kind of like the coins flying into your backpack mm -hmm. or something like that. So right now, it's just got this silly overlap. Um, oh, that's actually one other thing I want to talk about real quick. So right now, these are they're actually blocking projectiles. And if we had other moving characters that weren't pawns, they would actually they could trigger them too. Okay. So the collision's not set up right on these. So you can edit collision on something uh, by going down to like picking a collision preset. And so the engine ships with a number of collision presets. This is one of the sort of least well understood parts of the engine, and it's actually it can be a little bit daunting to get yeah. into. But it's also really powerful, and it makes it a lot easier to have consistent behavior throughout your game mm -hmm. if you go into your project settings and set some stuff up. And so I made a couple earlier. So we go to Project Settings, Collision. You can see that there's this list of presets here. I can. Oh, <laughs> I could accidentally. I've. I can't you get have, to the yeah, title bar. Maybe one pixel. Yeah, you had. You had a pixel. Do uh, maybe Windows down. 
Oh, that worked. There we go. Sorry about that. Minor technical difficulties. OK. So now we can see that there's these two at the bottom that are, you know, you can see it's got a different icon. These were added at the project level. So I created a projectile, which is what's used for the projectile. And then I created one for the uh, what I call player sensor. And so you can make a new one here. And so we'll just make like another one that's like the same as player sensor. And so I'm going to define this to, by default, it's query only, because I'm, I'm just trying to sense. I'm not trying to block the player. Mm -hmm. And the object type, I'm going to make this. You, you can pick different things, but like we'll make this be world dynamic because the sensors are probably sitting somewhere in the world. And now you pick whatever your default collision response is. So we actually want it to ignore everything. And then we turn on for pawns only that we overlap. And so now, whenever something hits the sensor, it's not going to block anything. So it won't block visibility or camera or mm -hmm. whatever. The projectiles will fly right through it. But if a player walks into it, then we know about it, but we don't prevent the player from walking into mm -hmm. it. So accept. So I just added another one to the list. So now that'll show up when I'm over here. So like where I pick collision presets, I can actually say you know player sensor for example. So now they've changed this to player sensor. We'll see that you know when I fire stuff at it, they just go right through. But the pawn still triggers it. So let's go back to. Okay, so now you know this is what's telling the player that it scored, and you probably you'd actually want to call a function here so that you could do something like you know play a sound like a, a clink or, or mm -hmm. whatever. But for right now, we'll just do sort of let's make it go into the backpack. And so at the moment, we're just immediately destroying the actor after we gave it a score. But I had in here a set actor collision enable so that it's it's not going to do anything once it's triggered. Like once it starts, nothing else is going to trigger it again. You can also use like a, a gate or something like that mm -hmm. as well. So then what we can do is we can play a timeline. And so a timeline basically just lets us define some curves inside. So we can add like a curve that is like how high and how close. And then let's add one more for scale. So scale will start at 1. And oops. then we'll make it go down to zero, or actually not quite to zero. So this will make it you know start big and go small. And you'll notice that I'm making everything sort of one and one. It's really helpful to make uh, timelines normalized because mm -hmm. that way, if you want to change the scale of it a little bit, you don't have to like go in and like reshuffle all the points. You can just multiply the output. Instead, and then that way, you know, it, it basically lets you tweak it a lot faster. Right. Um, how far will be a similar thing. We're going to start at zero, and we're going to go to one, and then uh, how high? We're actually going to go up and then back down. So we'll start at zero, then we'll go up to one, and then we'll come back down to like you know there. So basically, it'll start at the height of the coin, and then we want it to go to the height of the player. So that's that's sort of a simple effect. And so we'll try this out and see how that feels, and then we might tweak it from there. So now we've got an update pin, and we've got these three parameters. So now we need to do something with them. So I want to move the actor from where it is, where it was to where it needs to go. So I need to know where it was. So I've actually created a variable already. So I can set the start point as where, where where's the actor. So we'll go ahead and grab the start point. Then play. Uh, I also grab the target actor, which is like basically what is the pawn that overlapped us? Which, grab over here. That way, if the player keeps moving around, the coin will follow them instead of it being moving to where we were. It'll move right. to where we are. So now every time we can figure out where we need to be. So we can lerp. So we can learn from where we were to where we want to be. And so 
Let's just only do this and see what that looks like. And then when we're finished, we still actually want to destroy the actor, basically, once it finishes this timeline. One last thing I'm going to check is use last keyframe. So instead of it always being length 5, it'll shrink it down to whatever the last interesting point you had in the timeline. And even if you go back and you make it a little longer... Yep, it'll, it'll auto-update. Yep. OK. So now we can see, well, that's it's OK. It's not very <laughs> good. So obviously, we want this to play a lot faster. So all timelines are actually also variables. And so you can grab, you can get access to it. So I'm just going to make a little more room here because we're kind of getting messy. And so, there we go. so I got the timeline zero variable. Now I can call set rate. So I can make this play faster or slower. So we normalized it to one unit. So like we, basically, we can just do one over the, the length that we want it to do, mm -hmm. and then that will make it play at that rate. So do one over, and then just promote this to a variable. We can call this um, coin to player rate. So let's make that. Four. And you can do instead of one over, like you, you can do this either way, but or actually, yeah, sorry. Coin to player duration is actually what it is. So instead we actually want this to be like you know point two. Let's try that. And of course we didn't call it. So it doesn't work so well. <laughs> it's an important step. Yep. So let's do that. All right, that's feeling should, a little should. bit meatier. Yeah. But let's let's now take advantage of those other two curves I did. So what we can actually do is set actor transform. Then we'll split this pin. And so you can either like do a make outside of it, or you can use split to actually like break things up to set multiple properties at once. It's also just how you prefer. Yep. To lay out your blueprints. So now I'm gonna go ahead and do an add. I'll explain this bit in just a minute. But so now we've got a scale wired in, and so we can make a scale from the how big. So now it's going to shrink down as it comes into your into your inventory, basically. Look at that. So that feels a lot better. Mm -hmm. But let's get it like you know flying into you. So okay. we want it to kind of come up in the air and then come back down. And so we've got a how high, so we can multiply that by float. And we'll split this further. So we're going to make like it go up and down in Z. So we can make this say like a, let's try 150 and see what that looks like. Swoop. So now that's feeling pretty good. Yeah. Let's you know just keep on making it a little bit neater. So you know we can make this these curves a little bit more interesting. So like you know we can add kind of a bit of wobble to the scale. That's you know it might be going a little bit fast Squash to be able stretch. to actually see it. Yeah, but yeah. you can get you you know you can get a lot of interesting juice from doing that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip making it rotate, but I'll show you what it looks like if I did. Um, doo -doo -doo. So here's one I made earlier. <laughs> it's been cooking all night. <laughs> so let's wire that in back up here where we did this. So we'll just skip all this other stuff, and it's going to go down to this, the version that I made before. And this won't actually score, but it'll show you. Oops. Well, messed something up there. <laughs> it looks like it's going to zero. Yeah. Oh, it's that's actually probably what it is. It probably missed the set point. So if we just actually break it right here, that'll probably do the trick. Oh, and the target actors. Yeah, that's the other thing that's not there. OK, so we'll just skip these two. 
There we go. Nice. So now you can see it's kind of like flicking into yeah. your, your backpack like a coin. And so it's really easy to, you know, just, we spent not even 10 minutes on that. Mm -hmm. and now it feels just completely different. Yep. It just makes the game feel a lot more fluid and alive. So those kinds of techniques can make, you know, can really start to make your game start to come together. So They all add up. Yep, absolutely. So uh, let's go ahead and do some questions. Yeah. Um, we, we, we have a few, uh, and I thought sure. one that came early in the stream was just general, um, just general questions, kind of interesting. As a student, how do I know I will get something back if I spend time learning Unreal? Um, I, there's no guarantees in life, I guess is the short answer. Um, you're going to, what, whatever you spend time on, you're going to get the knowledge back from doing that, if nothing else. So like you're, you will know how to do something you didn't know how to do before. And usually those lessons are applicable across you know, a broad range of things. Uh, for Unreal specifically, there's lots of people use Unreal for uh, game jams. Like Unreal, Unity, and Godot are like the three biggest mm -hmm. uh, project uh, engines that were used for um, Global Game Jam this past year, for example. Um, a lot of those ideas are transferable. And obviously, I think it's a great thing. Like we like to hire people who have Unreal knowledge. I mean, it's not a require hard requirement for somebody we'd want to hire, mm -hmm. but uh, it's absolutely valuable. And whatever your goal, like if you want to make games or whatever, now you know something in order to make games in. So. And you're right. It definitely, you know, the, the idea of how you set up a gameplay framework or, or a game loop or, mm -hmm. you know, how you, uh, like you were talking about earlier, how you, you know, split um, different functions of logic into different actors. That's yeah. It doesn't matter which engine you're in. Yeah. Um, it goes across all of them. Um, they were curious if the, the 20 jam entries that you've done, if they were all using Unreal or if you were working in some other tools. Um, so when I first started doing jams, it uh, was actually even before UDK. And so I used to use uh, XNA, which was a Microsoft framework uh, in C Sharp that allowed you to do 2D and 3D graphics. And it was like just this little kind of immediate mode API to okay. like, you know, draw a sprite here or draw, you know, add a mesh to the scene or whatever. And so first several jams I did in that. So like all those 2D games that I showed off mm -hmm. there at the beginning were done in XNA. And then uh, when we uh, did UE4 uh, 4.0 and it was publicly available for everybody, um, that's when I started using UE4 for jams. Because like now it's available, anybody can download it. I can work with somebody who's not working at Epic mm -hmm. in order to also use it. So I've been using uh, UE4 for game jams since, I don't know, like 2015, 2014, something like that. Cool. So I've used it for basically every jam I've done since then, except for that one year where I made a card game. Because there I didn't use any engine. I used markers. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone, I think, they joined a little bit later in the stream, and they were curious how you made the window red. Oh, uh, yeah. If you wanted to just show that off again. Yeah, sure. So uh, you can make uh, the, it's in the project settings, or sorry, editor preferences. So under appearance, there's the editor main window background override and child window background override. And you pretty much always want to set both of these to be the same thing. They're just set, split out for technical reasons. So like now we can make this blue and make this blue. So now the, the project I'm working in is blue. So that, that's really useful for um, just keep, when you're running multiple copies of Unreal, uh, keeping them separate. Another thing you can do, and this, th this doesn't fix anything or make anything better, it's just sort of like a silly little polish thing, is you can actually change your splash screen. Uh, so like when the editor starts up, you can set what is the image uh, that the editor uses. So that's actually under project settings. The amount of times you open and close the editor, though, <laughs> makes this a nice little a sort yeah. of, I don't know, it's, it's polish and juice yep. for the project itself. Yep. And so then you can just import a different image here. And uh, if you hover over it, it tells you where the default image is. So you can use that to kind of get the dimensions and size, although it doesn't have to be exactly that size. But okay. that's something like you can basically use that like a template and then just paint on top of it if you want to make you know, customize your editor a little bit more. Um, how long do you think you should whiteboard your ideas before starting in the actual project? I think that really depends on like what your team composition is and like how how integral they are to the thing, I guess. So if you're trying to make like a narrative driven game or something like that, or you're mm -hmm. trying to tell a story in the game, it's probably gonna be you're gonna spend a longer time figuring out exactly what you want to do, like what the story beats are and stuff like that. 
Whereas if you're going to be like, you know, I'm going to make a game where you go shoot some robots, uh, you you may be able to jump into the game d development a little bit faster, and you might like do planning as you go. I think in both cases, it's important to realize that your initial plan may not be what you end up making. Mm -hmm. So it's always okay to pivot halfway down. And so you might be like, well, this isn't coming together. Let's let's huddle together as a team and try and, you know, what do we need to do? Or, okay, we got our initial version done. Where do we want to go next? Like, and now have that conversation again of like, what ideas do we want to do? Um, Different game jams do different things. Like some game jams, you'll come as a team. Like you, you already know who you're going to work with. You may not know what you're going to work on because you're waiting for the theme. Other game jams will do kind of a uh, team building exercise, where you know if people come and they don't already have a team or nobody has a team, then you might do something like, okay, here's here's what the theme is. Now people break up into groups and discuss like amongst themselves, like what are some ideas. Then usually do a pitching process, basically, where anybody who has an idea, like, I want to make this game, or I want to see this game made, and they basically have, like, they can argue or describe what they want to do. Mm -hmm. They can stand up and, like, pitch that out, and then you can see if other people are like, oh, that'd be cool if you did this, or I want to work on that too, and then you can kind of start to, to group together. I and heard of a global game, or I think it was a train jam, I think you mentioned mm -hmm. that, where um, someone had the entire train pitch in towards the one yep. the one game. Yep. It, they, I think they were doing kind of like a meta game almost where they basically had like poster boards and they would go around and ask like, you know, can you add a rule to one of these games that's on this poster board? And so it was able to like bring everybody in together in, in, to make this one project basically. That's, that's so really it seems cool. like a cool idea. Yeah. And every year at the train jam there's always one or two people who are uh, sound artists or sound designers mm -hmm. and they will like literally just walk around with a giant sign that's like I will make audio for your game because they'll often end up working on several different projects mm -hmm. instead of just one project the entire time and so. train them is no competition so there are no rules yeah. in terms of how many people you can be on a team and exactly although there's always practical constraints yes. for, like if you're working um, on a team together like the more people you have the harder collaboration is mm -hmm. the harder merging assets the harder just getting everybody on the same page is so like usually four to six people I think is probably the the sweet spot for a game jam project and don't be afraid to bring on people who are new yeah you never know you know what they might be able to bring to the project mm -hmm. um, they were curious about when you were working in the material there on the sign yeah. is there a way to trigger the start when hit so the sign starts from minus one uh, yeah, so what I was using right now, or uh, let's just open up that material. So I'm just using this time as input data. What you can actually do is you can send down as a parameter, like the hit effect active could actually be a time to start. Okay. And then you can subtract that off the time, and then now you've, you, you've synchronized the phase to whatever you want it to be. And you could also actually use that same parameter to, to do in the blue pr in the material the turn it off after a period of time because what you could do is you know send the time that it started at and subtract that from the time now you know it's 0 to 0 0.2 or whatever and then you actually lerp it back down directly on uh, the blueprint so that, that's one thing you can do kind of shove the work over to the GPU nice um, are jam games enough to get a game designer precision in AAA games uh, I couldn't really speak to that like I'm I'm not uh, hiring for game designers, like I, I interview programmers, and so what our game design team looks for from a designer, I, I, I don't know for sure. I think it would be depend. I mean, I'm not. I wouldn't say that it's an absolute no. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are lots and lots of game jam games that are, you know, astonishing in terms of what they were able to accomplish in yeah. such a short time. Yep. Uh, it was just a. I can't say. Not a. It's not a no. What I will say is. I'm usually positively impressed by, like, you know, it's a good thing when I see people have, you know, game jam projects or, you know, it doesn't have to be a game jam project, just like extra projects that they've worked on, you know, it, it shows that they're, you know, interested, they're, they're, you know, doing the, the lifelong learner kind of stuff mm -hmm. of, you know, trying to improve their skills and stuff like that. So that's always a positive for me. And it's fun to work with someone who has passion for yeah. what you're working on, right? Mm -hmm. Who does it in the spare time, not getting paid. Yeah. Um, 
Someone was asking if we were if we were planning on giving a talk about packaging games. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have anything planned at the moment um, directly in terms of that, but we will. I will continue to try to do these more general um, streams where we discuss, you know, typical workflows and things that are important that you might not pick up going through um, mm -hmm. Unreal Online Learning and etc. Um, what what do you recommend for a shared repo for Teams? I found it difficult to set up Git LFS on site. Um, so what I've done in the past is uh, either use like a web hosted SVN. So like uh, DreamHost, I think, has just like a one-click deploy to create a SVN repo. OK. Um, and so like that's what I normally use for Global Game Jam. Um, Train Jam, you have no internet. Like you're, you're going through like, you know, canyons and stuff yeah. where you have no cell service, no internet in a lot of times. And so what, I, what I've done the past couple of years is I actually carry like a little single box computer, a single board computer like about that big, that I actually run a local copy of Perforce on. And Perforce has a free license if you're using no more than five users. And so I just set up Perforce on that. And then it's hooked up to a router. And so we just hook up our laptops to that router. And then you know, can use Perforce on the train. That's good. And you can bring that you know, last sort to any other jam as well. Mm -hmm. You might not have it. Yep. Um, those were those were all the questions that we had for today. So, okay, uh, cool, Michael. Thank you so much for coming on and yep. showing some of your tips and tips and tricks. I learned a lot. I hope Chat learned a lot. It seemed like it. They said that they were amazed like six times about some of the little <laughs> little uh, tricks they did. Yep. And there was an interesting quote. Um, they were saying. Uh, is it me or Nolan's cadence a very Bob Ross style? Uh, just got to <laughs> say, happy little t pose. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Um, we're just going to paint a little uh, camera shake here. Yeah, a little camera shake. Yeah, <laughs> or curves in the timeline. Yeah. yeah. Um, happy little auto interpolation. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thanks, everyone, who joined cool. us today for watching. Um, Have a great day. Next week, we will be going over uh, network replication fundamentals uh, with Michael Prinky, one of our technical writers here at Epic. Um, and so if you're interested in how to get started uh, with making network multiplayer games in Unreal Engine, uh, you should tune in next Thursday. As always, make sure you check out your local user groups. Uh, we are doing a big revamp when it comes to how that is managed. So keep an eye out uh, for a bit of an announcement. And uh, the new site is going to look really cool in terms of how you see meetups, uh, where they are in the world. Um, and, and so forth. And uh, it's, it's a bit of a new community there. Uh, we'll be launching that really soon. It's, it's, it's a work in process. Um, and as always, make sure you follow us on social media for all news on Unreal. That's where we post the next live streams, um, what's going on in the community. And I do want to mention that uh, we are not doing a Winter Jam this year, but we are planning a different kind of contest leading up, and then we will do a Spring Jam. Um, so there, there will be a Spring, spring Jam this year. Yep. And it's coming oh, up. Actually, that's one other thing. Let me pull up a site. Real quick here. Yeah, go ahead. We got nine minutes till <laughs> complete complete right. curfew. They're hitting the two-hour mark. So um, itch.io has a uh, website calendar, basically, where basically people will put game jams that yeah. they're running. And so, the, as you can see from this, there's basically always a game jam running, or always many game jams running. So if you're ever in the mood to do something, you know you can always jump into one of these. And you also notice not all of these are like you know a two-day jam. Uh, like some of them are like they run for a month or things like mm -hmm. that. That doesn't necessarily mean you should spend a month working on your game. It's just more like they're trying to be fit people's schedules because you know not everybody can like spend two days on a weekend yeah. doing nonstop game jamming. That's like you know you, you've got other things you have to take care of. And so. Um, like I think that's actually one of my favorite jam formats is like simple jam was a couple of years ago where it was like no more than five game rules, no more than five assets, and spend no more than two days on it over like a two week period. Oh, okay, so you have to like clock your time yeah. as you're working on it. Well, it wasn't. It, it's not as rigorous as that. Mm -hmm. It was just more like I'm giving you two weeks because I know you got you know, you've got other things to do, but you know I don't want you to use the full two weeks if that makes sense. That's, that's pretty cool. I like and that. I think. Uh, Alan has proposed noon jam, which is you know <laughs> work between uh, you know eleven and uh, twelve thirty uh, on your jam for the next fifteen years. <laughs> Interesting. I don't think it's formally posted, but he's talked about it on Twitter before. Okay, I'd like. To, uh, yeah. I'm curious to see how <laughs> <laughs> how that how that would yeah. go. Uh, thanks for the little tidbit about itch. Mm -hmm. uh, with that said, it's time for us to end the stream today. Yep. Uh, I hope you all had a great time. Uh, I know I did. I think Michael. Showing out some real cool stuff here. And so with that said, we hope to see you all next week. And have a great rest of, of the week and the weekend. And rest a little bit. Like Michael said, make sure you get that rest in so right. that your brain can think properly. Definitely. Bye, everyone. Bye.